Kings chapter 20 in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 20, if you'd like to go ahead and have that passage open in front of you in your Bible. It is a blessing to be here, as always, to have this opportunity to be together and to worship together, as I was corresponding with, Jer with Jeremy a while back. He, after a while he said, well, by the way, I'm going to be gone. And so I'm disappointed that we don't get to see him. But uh, at the same time, I appreciate the opportunity to fill in for him while he's away in Arkansas. And it's always, always a wonderful thing to be able to come here and to meet with you and to worship together and to edify one another. And so I thank you again for the opportunity to stand before you and to open God's Word with you and to share some things from His Word with you this morning. Always wonderful to be back here in Toronto and to see familiar faces and not only to see familiar faces and those we've worked with in the past, but to also see some new faces and that's always a blessing as well. That's a good thing. And so we're glad for all who are here this morning. As is always the case, if you have any questions about anything that I say or present, then I welcome those questions and welcome the, the opportunity to give a Bible answer to any Bible question that is raised. What have they seen in your house is the title of our lesson this morning. And that title is taken from a statement, a question that's raised in 2 Kings chapter 20. Now, what we have here in 2 Kings chapter 20 is a situation where King Hezekiah showed the Babylonians everything that was in his house. Hezekiah, at the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 20, faced the prospect of having his life come to an end due to an illness. And the prophet Isaiah spoke to him on that occasion and told him that he was going to die. And Hezekiah prayed to God. God extended his life by 15 years. Now when he was healed of this illness that would have otherwise taken his life, what happens then is that the king of Babylon sends certain officials from Babylon to come and congratulate King Hezekiah, the king of Judah, on his recovery. Now this is what we see in 2 Kings 20 and verse 13. Here the Bible says, And Hezekiah was attentive to them, and showed them all the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, once Hezekiah had shown these Babylonians all of the material wealth and riches and treasure of his house, the prophet Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and asks him a series of questions about the matter. Continuing on there, in verses 14 and 15, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What do these men say? From where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came from a far country from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Alright, there is our question in verse 15. Prophet's question is an important question for us to think about. Now you'll notice in what we were reading there in 2 Kings chapter 20 that the question, what have they seen in your house, has to do with physical things. 
material things, the treasures that the king of Judah had. And here we have Hezekiah, though he was a good king in many respects and loyal to the Lord, in this case, he engaged in a prideful display of his material things, his treasures that were in his house as he showed them to the Babylonians, and there were negative consequences that would follow from this. But the question is one that lends itself to a spiritual application for us. Just as Hezekiah here needed to give an honest answer when asked, what have they seen in your house with regard to his material things, so it is that each of us needs to give an honest answer to that same question when it comes to spiritual things. The question for us is this. What have they seen in your house? See, by asking ourselves the same question that Isaiah asked Hezekiah here, we are forced to take an honest look at what is really going on from day to day in our own homes. What kinds of attitudes? What kinds of actions? What kinds of behaviors? What kind of conduct? What, what is going on in our houses? In our homes? What is seen there? You know, the psalmist... In Psalm 127 and verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Our homes need to be founded and built upon the instruction of the Lord. And if they're not, we have a problem. In our busy lives, there is a great deal of activity taking place in our homes. But is that activity pleasing to God, or is it all in vain? Is it all worthless? Is it all empty? Or worse, is it sinful activity? What is seen in your house? What is seen in my house? That's the question for us to think about as we study together this morning. What have they seen in your house? Let's start with this. Is love seen in your house? That's God's plan. God's plan is for there to be love in the home. Husbands and wives are to love each other as they carry out their respective roles in the home. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. The Apostle Paul says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Here is God's plan for the way in which the marriage relationship is to function. There is to be love in the home between the wife and the husband. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul writes that the older women are to admonish or teach the young women to do what? To love their husbands, to love their children. Love in the home. When it comes to the love that is to exist in the home between the husband and wife, we want to notice Ephesians chapter 5, the way that Paul puts it here. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. And then in verse 28, He says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's the kind of love that is to exist in the home. That the husband loves his wife just as he would love himself. That he loves his wife in the way that Christ loves the church. Love is in the home 
when God's plan is followed, when each member of the family is truly acting in love. What does that mean? Acting out of what is in the best interest of the other person. Not selfishness, not just looking out for me, 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 me. But love is in the home as God would have it when each one is looking out for the other. Is God's plan being followed in our homes? Sometimes instead of, instead of love being present in the home, the home becomes like a war zone where there are battles going on. Instead of loving one another, husbands and wives may fight with each other. Sometimes they belittle each other, put each other down, constantly criticize each other, and become bitter and resentful toward each other. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 1. The inspired wise man says, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Now he's not just talking about the walls of the house, the physical structure. When he talks about the wise woman building her house, he's not, he's not necessarily referring to her taking a hammer and nails and building the physical walls of the house, but he's talking about what's going on in that family. What's happening there? The wise woman is going to strengthen her family. The foolish woman is going to tear it apart and destroy that house from the inside. Think about his love seen in your house. Is your home a loving home or have you allowed it to become filled with self-destruction and bitterness? What have they seen in your house? There needs to be love in the home, looking out for the best interest of one another, treating others the way that we should. Well, along that same line, what about this? Is respect, is respect seen in our houses? God's plan is for there to be respect in the home. Respect should be present between the husband and wife in the home. The wife as we read earlier, is to submit to the husband and the husband is to love his wife. The wife is not the husband's slave. The husband is not the guy whose main purpose in life is to finance his wife's lifestyle. That's not the right kind of relationship. But the marriage relationship, Paul writes, and again, looking at Ephesians 5 and verse 33, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There has to be respect in the home. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, notice what is said to husbands here. The Apostle Peter writes, Husbands, likewise dwell with them, he's talking about wives, Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. There's to be mutual respect here. He talks about the husband here giving honor to the wife, treating the wife as a weaker vessel. Not that, not that she is incapable of doing anything, but the weaker vessel. You think about... You think about the very fine vessels we may have in our homes, maybe kept up high in, in the cabinet or, or locked away or behind glass. The, those fine vessels, the weaker vessels, those fragile vessels that maybe we only bring out on special occasions. That's the kind of idea that's presented here, that the husband is to handle his wife with that kind of honor. Husbands and wives have to treat each other and speak to each other in an honorable and respectful manner. Well, what about children in the home? In Ephesians chapter 6, in verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. 
Here again, we see the idea of respect. Honor being shown in the home. In this case, honor from parents or from children to their parents. Mutual respect must be present in the home between all members of the family as they interact with each other. Is God's plan being followed in our homes? Sometimes instead of being a place where respect is shown, the home can become a place where everyone is allowed to say whatever he wants to say and act however they feel like acting. And it's not that we can't be respectful. Right? It's, not that we, it's not that we can't exercise self-control. You know, we may be there you know, yelling and losing our temper with family members and just saying whatever we feel like. And then what happens? The phone rings and all of a sudden, hi, yeah, how are you? Good afternoon. How can I help you? You know what that shows? It shows that we can be respectful. We can control ourselves when we want to. And we have to show that kind of self-control, that kind of honor, that kind of respect as we interact with one another in our homes. Instead of husbands and wives fulfilling their proper roles in the home with proper respect for each other, Sadly, the home sometimes becomes full of all-out competition. Who's going to get to be in charge? Who's going to get to be in control? The husband or the wife? Well, we're going to have a struggle over that to see who gets to call the shots. That's not God's plan. Instead of children honoring their parents, what so often happens is that children are allowed to speak disrespectfully toward their parents and ignore their parents' instruction and even criticize and belittle their parents. That's not God's plan. The problem of disrespectful behavior in the home could be erased by doing one simple thing, applying the Lord's instruction. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 31, what did Jesus say? And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be talked to in a disrespectful way. I don't like people to, to belittle me. I don't like to be treated like that. And we need to carry this principle into our homes. You don't want it done to you, don't do it to those in your house. A lot of the problems would go away if we would just apply this simple instruction. Is respect being shown in your home or have you allowed that disrespectful behavior, those bad attitudes to take over? What have they seen in your house? Well, what about this? Is discipline, is discipline seen in your home? God's plan is for discipline to be seen in the home. According to God's plan, children are to be disciplined so that they obey their parents. Colossians 3 and verse 20. Paul says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now we understand that the obedience that is commanded here is to be consistent with what God has commanded. Obviously, the child is not to obey his parents if his parents are teaching him to lie or to steal or to do things that are contrary to God's will. But here, given that Paul is writing to Christians who should be behaving properly, children are to obey their parents. This is what pleases God. But in order for children to obey their parents, what has to happen? Parents have to do their job. Parents have to be correcting the children, disciplining the children, so that they will be motivated to obey and to understand the importance of obeying. We look at the book of Proverbs. We have a number of examples of instruction along these lines. In Proverbs 29, verse 17, 
We read that the proverb writer says, Correct your son, and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. That's our job as parents. Don't just let the children do whatever they feel like doing and act however they want to act. Correct them. Teach them. Instruct them. Discipline them. And notice in that same passage, there in Proverbs 29 and verse 15, he says, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. That's what happens when children are allowed to do whatever they feel like, say whatever they want, act however they want to act. That brings shame to the parents. Correction, discipline is what is needed. Children need guidance. And they need parents who will patiently and carefully discipline them in the home out of love, out of what is best for them. Proper discipline takes place in the home when parents lovingly carry out discipline, not because we're just angry and we're taking out our frustrations, but because we're doing what is for the good, for the well-being of the children, so that they will grow up to be adults who act properly. Is God's plan being followed in your home? If you have children, do you love your children or do you hate them? I think, well, that's a strange question. I don't hate my children. Well, some say, some say, oh, I just love my, I've heard people say that, I just love him so, I love my child so much, I could just, I could never, I could never discipline him. I love him too much to spank him. I, I just, I just couldn't say no to her, to my little child. Just couldn't do it. Well, think about this. Proverbs 13, verse 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. That's why I asked the question, do you love your children or do you hate them? Right? The world's way of thinking is, oh, I love him too much to discipline him. No, that's false. That's false. That's the devil's lie. You hate your child if you refuse to correct your child. You love your child if you discipline him promptly, if you take care of the problem, if you address it, if you provide the instruction to him. If you love your children, you'll demand obedience from them. If you love your children, you'll provide them with the guidance that they need. That's what parents do who love their children. Now just look around. What kind of world are we living in? In our society, we are reaping the destructive harvest of a generation of children who were never properly disciplined at home. And now they've grown up to be adults. They were never told no at home. And now they are adults. Now they're running things in our society. Now some of them are in charge of things in our society. And why should they play by anyone else's rules? Why should they submit to anybody's rules when they never had to obey mom and dad's rules at home? That's the world in which we live. And it all started back in the home. That's where it all started. And then on the other hand, there are those that sink to the lowest depths as parents in verbally abusing their homes, physic or vis verbally abusing their children in their homes, or physically abusing and beating their children in their homes, or even sexually abusing their own children in their homes. That goes on in a lot of homes. It's a tragedy. It's terrible. And God sees. God knows. God hears the cries of the helpless. There has to be proper 
discipline in the home. Not these extremes of never disciplining or the other extreme of being abusive. There has to be loving, proper discipline and guidance in the home. Is that what's happening in our homes or have we followed the ways of the world when it comes to parenting? What have they seen in your house when it comes to discipline? Well, let's connect something else to that. What have they seen in your house? Is spiritual training seen in your house? God's plan is for there to be spiritual training going on in the home. The guidance of children that is needed in the home goes beyond just teaching the children to honor and obey mother and father. What is also needed is spiritual training where the children are taught to honor and obey their heavenly Father. To obey God. And when it comes to the training that's supposed to take place in the home, let's look again at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Paul says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Training and admonition of the Lord. We are given a wonderful example of what that means in the instruction that was given to the Israelites under the Old Covenant concerning spiritual training of children in the home. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. Just before the Israelites were to enter into the promised land, this is what God instructed through Moses he said to them, In these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. This is what is supposed to be going on in the home. Taking God's words and diligently teaching them in the home. Spiritual training. Spiritual training is taking place in the home when parents take the time and put forth the effort to teach their children the Word of God. Show their children what it means to put God first in life. Is God's plan being followed in our homes? You know, the problem in so many homes is that we aren't training our children to understand and obey the Word of God because we have not first trained ourselves to understand and obey the Word of God. It starts with us before we can pass it on to our children. <coughs> As parents, we need to understand that in being blessed with children, we have been given a great responsibility. Our job is to train those children so that they will grow up to serve the Lord. That's the main thing. Now, while we're so busy making sure, and I see parents all the time, parents who are Christians, members of the church, we're so busy all the time making sure that our children are trained in secular education so that they'll grow up to be well-rounded individuals and they'll have good careers and make lots of money. We better be make, making sure that we're spiritually trained. Make that the top priority. Our children can make all the money in the world and have the greatest career in the world and end up in hell for eternity because we didn't train them spiritually. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. We have to train our children if you want your child to grow up to be a faithful servant of God who will spend eternity in heaven, you've got to do the training at home to help that child to serve God now. And this is not just for parents. I know some of us 
here or aren't parents or, or children are already grown or whatever it may be. But there is still to be spiritual training going on at home. Husbands and wives need to be reading God's Word together, discussing God's Word together. We need to be praying together in our homes. Is that kind of thing going on in our homes? It needs to be. And especially as parents, it is our job to see to it that proper training goes on in our homes so that our children are guided guided down the path that leads to eternal life instead of being left to themselves to head down the path that leads to destruction with everyone else. Is spiritual training taking place in our homes? Or are we teaching our children that earthly pursuits, school activities, sports, recreation, money, careers, are we teaching them that all those things are number one? Those are the most important. Which is it? What have they seen in your house when it comes to spiritual training? But what about what about this? What about godliness? Is godliness seen in your house? God's plan is for godliness to be seen in the home. Look with me at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Begin reading with me in verse 11. Here the Apostle Paul writes, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's what we're supposed to be as Christians. People who are living soberly, righteously, godly in the midst of this world, we are to be people who are zealous for good works. People who are following the Lord's instruction. To live a godly life is to live in a way that shows that you are always aware of God. Godly people are those, those people who know that God is there. God is watching. God is interested in what we're doing and how we're living. And because we're aware of that, we have reverence for Him. And we stop and think about what we're doing and what we're saying. And we stop to think, will God be pleased if I do this? Will God be pleased if I say this? Will God be pleased if I act like this? That's what it means to be godly. We're focused on those things. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, we studied this passage Bible class this morning, but let's notice Paul says, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's the kind of life we're supposed to be living. A life of godliness and reverence. Godliness is the opposite of worldliness. See, it's different from the way everybody out here is living their lives. They're not aware of God. They don't care about God. We came down from, from up north this morning. We drove three hours to get here from up north this morning. And you know what happened as we came south? As we got closer to the city, what did we see? Everybody going to church? No. We saw on the 400... All these cars, tons of cars heading north on Sunday morning to do what? Go do whatever they want. Go play. Long weekend, right? Who cares about God? Who cares about worshiping God? That's worldly thinking. That's worldliness. 
We are to be people of godliness. And that applies in our homes. Our homes should be filled with godly and reverent behavior and speech. Our homes should be one place in this world where filthy language is not heard. Our homes should be one place in this world where irreverence is not tolerated. Our homes should be a place in this world where lewd conduct, immoral conduct, is not allowed in. Godliness is displayed in the home when the members of the family conduct themselves in a way that meets with God's approval. When the entertainment in the home is something that would meet with God's approval. When the recreation activities of the home are the kind that would meet with God's approval. Good and wholesome activities in the home. That's where Godliness is seen in the home. Is God's plan being followed in the homes? In Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, Paul says to Christians, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying, don't be like everybody else. Don't be like everybody else. Don't do what they do. Don't be like all those people that don't care about God and just want to go get drunk on the weekend and don't have the interest in spiritual things to stop and think about what God has given them and blessed them with and to think about trying to follow God's instruction. Don't be like all those people. Don't talk like they talk and dress like they dress and act like they act. Be changed. Be transformed into what God wants you to be. What kinds of television shows are we watching in our homes? There's a lot of filth that gets piped in the home, comes through that TV screen. What are we allowing ourselves to be entertained with? Movies, television shows, what are we allowing in our homes? What kind of images are we allowing on the computer screens in our homes? Or on our phones and devices? What are we allowing in our homes? What kind of example is being set in our homes when it comes to the kind of language that is used in our homes? When it comes to the choices of entertainment that we're allowing our children to be exposed to in our homes, which is winning in our homes? Godliness or worldliness? Which one is winning? Is godliness prevailing in your home or have you given in to the ways of the world and allowed the filth of the world to poison and infect your home? What have they seen in your house? Now you see, here's the thing. As we think about these, these different items that we've looked at this morning concerning our own houses, we may hide what is really going on in our homes behind closed doors. We may hide what is really happening from our friends, from our neighbors, even from other members of the church. We may hide what's really going on in our homes from all those people. But we will never hide it from God. He sees into each and every one of our homes. Amen. All of these things are what He expects to be seen when He looks into our homes. We won't hide it from God. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14 tells us, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God knows. God knows. It may be the case that we need to make changes when it comes to what is going on in our homes. What have they seen in your house? Think about these things this morning as we consider God's Word together. We're going to enter into the remainder of our worship.
And in a few moments, I'll have some more things to say by way of exhortation and invitation before we bring our time together to a close this morning because there may be things that we need to correct. There may be things that we need to straighten out before we leave here this morning in obedience to God. So let's keep these things in mind. I'm not ashamed to 